that all five commissioners are present today in the Bollinger Room, and therefore we have quorum. Uh, this will be the time and place for public comment. I understand we do have one commenter this morning. Did you want to come up and provide public comment? Come up to the microphone here. No? Okay. Thank you for letting me come this morning. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Michelle McEwen. And I would like my business here today is to make you aware of what I believe should have been one of the first things that was um, should have been talked about between the client, me, and Northwestern Energy. Um, my husband and I have owned several businesses. And as a customer service, one of the first questions is, is when am I going to get that service? Well, I believe that um, Northwestern Energy is kind of lacking a little bit. I'm in the process of moving. I was actually had to force to move. But um, so right now, currently, I'm living in my camper because Northwestern Energy cannot come and put my uh, utilities in for five weeks. I have to pay them first to even before I get on the list. Once I pay them, then I get on the list. I finally got assigned a date of the 28th of uh, uh, this December, and I put, um, I put my money in almost two weeks ago, I think. So it's taken them five weeks to give me electricity. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is a very unacceptable um, service, customer service. Um, I talked to Tony. He said he has hired five contractors, but they're still five weeks behind. Now, if I don't like a service, I can go somewhere else. If Walmart doesn't provide me a service, I can go to Target or I can go to Shopco. But here, I can't go anywhere else. Vigilante is the only one out there, and they're not letting me hook up with Vigilante. So, you know, I don't mind waiting one and a half to two weeks worth of service, but I think it's very unacceptable for them to take five to six weeks to get me service. It's an essential service. Electricity is essential service. And I don't think it's right that a cu their customer service, they're lacking in customer service. They need to step up the bar. If they can't find people to um, fulfill the order, then they need to seek elsewhere and get some more people and get this business done in a lot less time. I don't think um, the public should have to wait five weeks for an essential service. It's not like I'm going down and ordering a bathtub and I can wait on it. Um, I'm living in my motorhome or my fifth wheel right now. And I have to because I can't get service. So I just want to make you guys aware of what's going on out there. And I think that beans that Montana, or I keep calling it Montana Power, it just shows you how old I am. Northwestern Energy, sorry about that, um, is the only one out there. We have no other choice to go elsewhere. And um, either the, uh, they, I just believe that they need to step up their service. I don't think it's right that uh, the customer, my, the client has to wait five weeks for such an essential service. I don't think that's right. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of what's going on out there. And I, um, if I need to, I'll even come in and to see if we can talk to Montana Power or what Northwestern Energy um, to see if they can hire more crews. They, they need to hire more crews, step up there. They need to step up there. You know, if, they're, if they want to be the only one out there, then they need to be more responsible for their actions, I believe. Thank you. For listening to me appreciate thank it thank you miss McEwen. are you from helena i am from helena okay yes. thank you mr chairman i wondered would you allow a clarifying question sure do you mind sorry go ahead that's all right thank you we don't normally uh, ask questions no, during this fine. but i'm just trying to understand what you told us and is it is this new construction or is the service already that's a the new wires are in so the wires aren't in yet and the meter's not on your house we yet? had to do that ourselves in order for them to even put us on the list we had to um, you have to put up your own stand and then buy your own box, your service box with the bubble in it or whatever, huh? meter box. And so we've done that already. And we couldn't even get on. You have to, in order to get on their list, you have to do some stuff. So you have to put in a, a meter base, put your meter box up, and put your electrical wire in from the meter box to your house. Then you can get stuck on the list. After you pay their fee. We had to pay um, because you're allowed so many footage 
and then you have to pay for the rest of the footage. So we had to pay our fee, and then we have to wait right. five weeks to get right. our service. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I was just trying to determine if there was physical work that needed to be done or if it was a matter of someone coming out and turning the service on. So it's physical work physical, that you're Yeah, waiting. they have okay. to bring a line in to us. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. McEwen. Any additional public comment? Nothing in the room, anything online? Seeing none. All right, let's move to our next um, agenda item. There are no changes to, the, to today's agenda. So let's move to action item number one, which is approval of the commission minutes for the week of November 30th, 2021. Is there a motion? So move, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner O'Donnell's moved. Is there a second? I'll second the motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Fielder seconded. Discussion or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of Commissioner O'Donnell's motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, minutes are adopted unanimously. Let's move to work session item number one. This is docket 2021.04.053. This is commission initiated. <clears throat> We're here to consider a draft notice of amendment to authorize staff to submit the draft notice of amendment for publication and make any non-substantive edits requested by the Secretary of State. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, commissioners. This work session is to consider the fee collection rulemaking that the commission initiated uh, a couple months ago at this point. Uh, as you'll recall, the last audit report identified the uh, lack of a process for collecting overdue fees as one area that the commission should improve upon. <clears throat> the proposed rule uh, improves upon the lack of an existing process by creating a process whereby the commission will require parties to file uh, IRS documentation, which we will need in order to turn over accounts for collection to state agency responsible for managing collections for the state of Montana. Uh, we received only one comment in response to the notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, no one commented at the hearing. That comment was provided in writing from the Montana Consumer Council. Consumer Council observes that as a government entity, an arm of the state, they do not necessarily have a separate taxpayer identification number. So they would like an exemption from the requirement of the proposed rule that would otherwise uh, force them to file a form that maybe doesn't exist for them. Uh, commission staff uh, recommends that the commission to create an exception to the rule for the MCC so that we can avoid trying to require them to file something that may not exist. Um, for that reason, uh, the packet before you includes a uh, draft notice of adoption that the commission staff would recommend that you adopt and authorize staff to published with the Montana Secretary of State. With that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Is there a motion? Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move we uh, 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 adopt this uh, recommendation for publishing. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Is there a second? Okay. Commissioner Pinocchi is seconded. Discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, uh, congratulate uh, staff on this. This is uh, another in a long list of positive uh, 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 actions that the commission has is taking in response to the, the last audit. Uh, it, it viewed as a very, very constructive uh, uh, process. And uh, I appreciate the audit pointing out the need for this particular uh, uh, process, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Additional discussion? I would echo Commissioner O'Donnell's comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hamilton and staff, for being on top of this and moving it forward. This has been a matter um, that has come up not only in the last audit, but previous audits as well. So I'm glad that we are moving forward with redressing this matter that was uh, continual in our audit findings. Additional discussion? Seeing none, oh. Ready to vote. Okay, ready to vote. All right, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. All right, let's move to work session item number two. 
This is docket 2020.09.094. This is also commission initiated to update the commissioners on the status of North Star investigation. Mr. Fink. Morning, Chairman, Commissioners. As a recall from the uh, November 16th work session, the commission issued a notice of commission action that provided interested parties or members of the public the opportunity to contest the irrigation and water supply issue. This was brought forth by the homeowners and nothing has been received to date on that matter. Uh, if we go back to the no November 2nd work session, the commission requested additional items to be included on the December report. I'll briefly summarize the report and then hand it over to commissioners for discussion and questions. North Star stated the meter register replacement should be completed by the end of March of 2022. The registers are located inside the homes where all flow is measured by this device. With this, there is a piping system that passes through the home before it hits the water meter. Rocky Mountain could not verify whether a homeowner has tapped into the piping before it reaches the meter and is taking the water out before it can be measured. Once all registers are working, they will be able to compare the amount of water that is being measured each month being pumped into the distribution tank versus the amount of water that is being used by all homes. North Star intends to discontinue service to homes who refuse access to the water operator and North Star is open to suggestions from the PSC or homeowners on this approach. The water operator with the help of the homeowners association has reduced the list of those who have not allowed register replacements to 10 homes and expects to arrange appointments with those customers in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure they've already made the, the appointments. With regard to the tariff discussion, this will begin with the comparative data report submitted, supported by the water operator and should be before the commission in December. The parties anticipate all issues will be resolved prior to April 1st of 2022. Uh, that sums up what I have for you uh, with me is Ben to answer any legal questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Mr. Reed, did you want to say anything? Okay, Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Fink, thank you for that report. I'm, I, I think it's important that we become absolutely clear about an issue or potential issue. Uh, am I to understand from your remarks that the systems as designed uh, in the homes uh, in North Star uh, are designed to measure all water flow, including irrigation. That's the design of the system. And that if someone is, quote, beating the system, it will have been some kind of clandestine activity on an individual's part to circumvent uh, measuring the irrigation water uh, by, by tapping into that pipe that goes from the main to the house and, and before the water reaches the meter. So it, it would be uh, individuals uh, actually conspiring, if you will, to misrepresent the amount of water they're using uh, in total. Is, is that an accurate understanding of the system design and any question that might be there with regard to unmetered water for irrigation? Chair, Commissioner Johnson, I would say that is exactly correct. I think you hit the nail on the head there. All right. Um, and yeah, under, excuse me, follow up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, that uh, there will be some, some uh, proactive monitoring of relative rates of usage as we move into the, the irrigation system so that if, if, if there's irrigation season, so that if there's some wide discrepancies in that regard, that it would at least be a flag. Did I understand you to say that? Chair Commissioner Johnson, that's correct. Uh, with the comparative data that's supposed to be coming in December, uh, we'll have a better understanding of how much water is being pumped into those distribution tanks in addition to what's being measured by the homes. And, and we they would be able to identify if there was a, a dramatic disparity of, of usage between house A and house, house B with similar other conditions, similar, uh, that would be recognizable? Chair sure, Commissioner Johnson, it sh should be recognizable. There is a distribution loss factor, um, but 
for the most part, they will be able to distinguish those factors and see which homes maybe possibly have done that. Okay, and in, in your follow-up, Mr. Chairman, one more and I'll be done. Uh, in your uh, conversations with the parties at North Star, um, there seems to be a relative level of comfort in terms of uh, making sure that that irrigation water for, for homeowners is in fact measured uh, as part of total flow. Chair, Mr. Johnson, that's correct. Yes, right. it is measured as total. Flow. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, for several years uh, now in the past, I was president of my homeowners association and we realized that one of the only tools that we had for enforcement of payment of dues or whatever is the ability to turn the water off to one of the units. Um, however, um, it was never certain what our legal authority for doing that is, water being um, absolutely essential for life and hygiene. Uh, has anybody researched what the legal authority of the utility would be for cutting off water uh, to a place? It's not a matter of somebody not paying, but it's just in the terms of not having an ad adequate meter to be able to, to justify that. It doesn't seem to me that that would meet the threshold of, being, of uh, allowing somebody to turn the water off. Uh, is any uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, Commissioner O'Donnell, uh, I, that question is clearly directed at me. I haven't done that research. I don't know the answer to it, but I can either send it to you directly after this meeting or prepare something for the next for the next North Star update. I would note that um, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Mr. Estreicher. Uh, because of some ambiguities in Mr. Modell's report that made it sound as if the 10 individuals were being, uh, the, were actively keeping North Star out of their homes. Uh, Mr. Osterreicher represented that that is not in fact the case and that it was simply a, it was, well, perhaps not simply, nothing about this case is entirely simple, but it was primarily an issue of scheduling and that the vice president of the HOA was making sure that those that those uh, appointments were being scheduled. So I don't think it'll come to that. That having been said, I will conduct the research necessary and report back to you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Panoji. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to point out a couple of issues here, being that I've run a water association for about 20 years. Mr. Fink, it, it's true that there wasn't water meters installed for some time in the system. Is that correct? Uh, Chair, Commissioner Pinochet, I would say there was water meters installed with the system. Uh, the reason that these are failing is because there was a defect and a recall on the register, which is currently what's being replaced. But isn't it true, and I think I understand this pretty clearly, that residents a lot of residents had no water meter weren't required to have one and then they've decided to make sure everybody had a water meter so they wanted to get them all installed did i misunderstand that that, that very could be true i don't know the answer okay, to that. so let me let me help everyone out here so when you manage water and there are no water meters and it's very common when you have no water meters to start asking for them because water is becoming an issue. When I'm called and they say, look, I don't have a spigot to water the ground, the irrigation and the lawn, and I don't want to dig a trench from the house uh, to the outside of the property, especially if it's two or three acres, they will ask me, could you dig a hole and, and put a water supply spigot out by the road away from the house? And we just don't have the money for that. So we say, no, but you can do that. So what happens is the homeowner will install a spigot of some sort before the home, which was approved because they, the water board doesn't want to pay for that. We let the landowner do that. So all of a sudden, homes start installing these and they save money because they don't want to dig a line from the house. 
Then we come along and want to add a water meter. But we add the water meter at the house, and here they have a spigot before the house. These people are innocent. They're not trying to get away with anything because if there were no water meters, it didn't matter where the spigot went. So I want to be clear that we don't come back and blame somebody uh, after we require a water meter, if they had a spigot before the meter, we simply have to ch change the rules and say, uh, if we're going to install the meter, are they grandfather clause in? Or is the water board going to cover the cost to dig it up and put in a collar and bypass that spigot? Then dig a line from the house after the meter to put the spigot in. And a very good argument would be made that the water board's responsible for that because they said, hey, look, because we have no water meter, if you want to put a spigot out in the yard, you can do that at your own expense. But now you're putting a water meter in, we're on the hook. As president of the water board, that's how I handled that. And I certainly don't want anyone to be looked at as getting away with something uh, in this situation. I think that's a fair point to, to bring up. Now, to cover Tony's point, when somebody didn't pay their water bill, I would have to go knock on the door and say, look, you got to pay the water bill. So we had to hire an attorney to cover that. And here's what the attorney said. I could dig up the line and put a shutoff out by the road off of their property if they were behind on their water bill. And then I could shut off the water and they'd say, holy crap, you shut off the water. I'll say, sir, you haven't paid your water bill in six months. And all of a sudden I get a check for the last six months. And I'll say, hang on. It costs us about $1,400 to dig up outside the street and put a shutoff in. So you're going to pay for the shutoff and your pass bill. And my legal team said I could do that. I just wanted to answer that question of how we handled people who didn't pay their water bill. But it was important the shutoff was put in outside of their property line, okay? But I just want to make it clear, before meters are put in, a lot of people put in spigots away from their home, somewhere between the line, the main line in their home, usually on their property. If we come in and add a water meter, that water's bypassed and then, the, the association or the people managing the water are on the hook to get that fixed because we approve that. I just want to point that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fielder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all the commissioner's remarks. I think they're enlightening. Um, I, I think it would behoove the commission, Mr. Chairman, to have North Star themselves report the actual status of those connections and verify in writing that the the meters are indeed capturing all uses to the best of their ability that those you know that it's standard as the vice chair went into that the irrigation comes uh, connects after the meter just just a confirmation from the the company themselves that that is the case and uh, i think that would help resolve the uncertainty around that question that, that's existed for a while. I, I think we, I, I think it sounds as if through the vice chair's question and your response that that's true, but I'm not seeing anything from North star that says that. And I'd like to see something from North star that says that unless you've got it and you can provide it to us. Um, so that's my first comment. And then the second one is, uh, did you want Mr. Fink to respond to that at this one? Uh, if, if one is necessary, do you have a response to that? Chair Brown, Commissioner Fielder, uh, North Star did, or in their filing, they did state that all water flow is being measured by the register that comes into the home and for domestic and non-domestic irrigation okay. and the home. Okay, very good. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, so additional questions, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Um, when this issue came up um, here earlier this year, they had uh, stayed late and ran ran some numbers to see if they could, you know, allow people to water a, a little bit instead of just shutting everyone off during the summer. And I I did some calculations, and I'm just 
curious as to, well, I'm, I'm more than curious. I'd like to see North Star's calculations on their quantity that's available through the system and, and planned, you know, planned water usage to help us get ahead of any potential shortfalls so that we, we have the data that demonstrates that they will be able to adequately provide water for domestic and irrigation uses next watering season. So we don't run into another shutoff. So can we get quantity information from the company? Chair Brown, Commissioner Fielder, we can request that with the next report. Okay. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. And then regarding the, um, the notion here in point E that the North Star intends to discontinue service to the homes that refuse access to the water operator. And they say they're open to suggestions from the PSC. I think Commissioner uh, Pinochi laid out some, I think some potential suggestions, but my, my question is, uh, I have two questions. Do they have a shut off that the utility controls? So will they be able to just shut it off uh, as Commissioner Pinocchi described, you know, out at the street, can the utility just uh, shut off the water there? Or, you know, are we talking about some other major operation like digging in and putting in a shut off? I think it would be good to have an answer to that. And the second one, this is maybe for Mr. Reed. Um, and this is, you know, if they do, um, if the utility does discontinue service to a customer, are there notice requirements that are already in, in our rules or is that something we need to, to take a look at to ensure that the resident had ample, ample notice and opportunity to uh, rectify the situation? That's, that's it for me. I appreciate the vice chair's um, questioning and staying on top of this issue. Thank you, Commissioner Fehler. Additional discussion? Commissioner O'Donnell? So we seem to be getting ourselves involved in like day-to-day -day operations of this utility. I'm wondering what is the, the limit of our legal authority to, uh, to be involved in this? Uh, we seem to be involved in minutiae rather than overarching issues at this point. Uh, would either of you care to comment? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, I honestly don't know how far down uh, into the weeds the commission has the legal right to go. Uh, I would suspect that it becomes a balancing test of the commission's sense of the usefulness of this investigation. Um, but I, uh, I can certainly look into what the commission has done historically and, and report back to you. Thank you. Commissioner Fielder. Mr. Chairman, I, um, I just have an innate sense that because it's our responsibility to supervise these utilities and that they are required to provide adequate services that we need to determine whether or not the um, processes are in place and the infrastructure is in place so that they can measure and provide adequate service. So these are, I think these are very fundamental um, issues and questions that we're discussing today and that are included in these reports. So um, we just need to know that they're, that they're going to be able to provide water next season without shutting it off at no fault of their own. Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, Again, a layman's opinion, not an attorney, but I think it is abundantly clear to me that our level of involvement at this point uh, clearly falls under our responsibility to assure uh, our quality of service uh, from a utility. Uh, I, I don't see that we're uh, at all uh, uh, reacting in an excessive uh, or, or inappropriate manner, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, I, I quite agree with both uh, comments here. I was just uh, saying we should keep in mind uh, that that limitation that of oversight rather than of, of uh, uh, a direction. So yeah, points very well taken. Thank you. Additional discussion? I would echo the comments of Commissioner Fielder and Vice Chair Johnson that we clearly have authority to ask these questions under our responsibility to ensure adequacy of service. 
on a regulated utility. Additional discussion? Seeing none, thank you for the update, Mr. Fink, Mr. Reed. All right, let's move to work session item number three. This is docket 2021.06.094. Webo County Commissioners, to, we're here to consider and act on CenturyLink's motion to dismiss the complaint filed by Webo County. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. <clears throat> This docket, as you'll recall, concerns Weibo County Commission's complaint against CenturyLink over the adequacy of certain services provided within the county. Uh, the complaint is a very brief document, but it does allege a number of issues with broadband access, with cell cellular service, and with, in particular, the 911 service and how calls are being placed erroneously or dropped uh, during inclement weather. Uh, the complaint is the only document that the commission needs to consider when evaluating a motion to dismiss. Uh, we currently have a motion to dismiss from CenturyLink, arguing that the complaint lacks standing and jurisdiction. So I'll briefly summarize those, but the staff memo provided with your meeting materials for today covers that, that those questions more completely. Um, as drafted, uh, the complaint does not, in the opinion of staff, clearly allege the commission's interest in the asserted harms here, and in particular, uh, the harms that the commission still has jurisdiction over. Now, Weibo has not responded to the motion to dismiss, and as a result, uh, the commission would have to make certain factual and logical leaps, assumptions that are not presently supported by the record, and are likewise not supported by any argument from Weibo, because again, we lack argument from Weibo in this matter. Additionally, to the extent the complaint alleges service quality issues with broadband or with cellular service, those are generally beyond the commission's jurisdiction. And so staff again recommends, uh, or, or it is the position of staff that it makes sense to grant the motion to dismiss on those jurisdictional questions as being beyond the commission's authority. Uh, all of that said, we have no reason to believe that the complaints about 911 service in Weibo County are fabricated or exaggerated in any way. Um, to fully understand uh, those issues and what the commission ought to be doing to address them, staff recommends opening a separate investigative docket that can be led by the commission and its staff to fully inquire into the status of the infrastructure in Weibo County and other rural areas of the state. So uh, on this, this particular work session, staff's recommendation has, has two parts. First, uh, staff recommends granting the motion to dismiss uh, Weibo County's complaint. And second, that the commission authorize staff to examine CenturyLink's infrastructure across rural Montana. And in addressing both of those points at the same time, we resolve the legal issues that appear to be present in Weibo's complaint, while at the same time ensuring that um, the commission has the full facts and record necessary in order to make an actual determination of the reasonableness and adequacy of the infrastructure in Weibo and other rural areas of the state uh, if, if the problem appears larger than Weibo. Uh, so with that, I would let the staff memo generally speak for itself, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions the commission may have. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, clarifying question for you. So it, you have a two-part recommendation here, which is to grant the motion to dismiss and then open an investigative docket. You recommend that we handle those uh, recommendations as separate votes, or can one, can they be subsumed in one motion? Uh, that's a great question, Chairman. I think it is up to the Chairman's discretion as to how to proceed under Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, I think it makes sense to do uh, actually either option. Uh, it might, frankly, be cleaner to have a clear motion granting a dismissal and then a separate clear motion uh, authorizing the investigation. I agree. Mr. Panocci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I absolutely support staff recommendations and ask that we vote on that. So to clarify, uh, Commissioner Pinocchi, our, as we discussed with Mr. Hamilton, do you want to make a motion to grant the motion to dismiss? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. So Commissioner Pinocchi has moved to grant the motion to dismiss. That has been seconded by Commissioner O'Donnell. Discussion? 
Commissioner Panucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the reasons I support the thought that we wanted to do two motions in one swoop is uh, I'm convinced that County Commissioners Weibo will be listening to this hearing and they want to know that we're doing something and explaining it in one motion shows that we are going to do something. Although I think it's fine that we handle the vote in two separate votes. I, I don't see any problem with that. But I do want to make it clear for the listening audience, Weibo County Attorney failed to send in complaint paperwork in a timely fashion and missed his deadline. And that's probably one of the main reasons that we have to dismiss this. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Pinochet, uh, it is uh, what I can confirm is that we did not receive a, a response to the motion to dismiss uh, from the Weibo County attorney who is representing the Weibo County Commission in this proceeding. Uh, beyond that, I, I'd be very cautious about uh, casting, uh, assuming any particular motivation or any particular lack of diligence or negligence on the part of any of the parties to the proceeding. What, what is material for today is that we, we don't have a response from Weibo County on this. And, and in addition to that, the complaint as phrased requires the commission to make logical leaps that I don't believe are legally appropriate at this juncture. Moreover, the commission can more adequately address this issue uh, by in instigating its own investigative docket. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. The rate payer really enjoys me being direct. And I, I think it's a, a failure that paperwork wasn't filed on time. So I want to make that clear. And of course, I'm, I'm eager to um, move forward with the complaint because there is nothing here that is fabricated. Weibo County has made more complaints on service than all other counties combined. And I'm urging this board and these fellow commissioners and my staff to understand that's serious. Uh, if uh, we don't have correctly working 911, People's lives are at risk. I can't make it any more clear than that. So um, with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to respond also uh, to this uh, separate motion uh, dismissing the complaint from Weibo is to say that uh, I appreciate uh, deeply the thorough analysis of the issues uh, by uh, our legal staff uh, and I want to uh, 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 serve notice also uh, that I deeply appreciate Weibo County uh, commissioners taking the initiative on this. Uh, I'm certain that the issues that they raise are not uh, particular to Weibo County only. Uh, and I think this is a wider issue that leads us to support the uh, second uh, recommendation here. So. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner O'Donnell. Additional discussion, Commissioner Fielder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to support the motion only because I'm satisfied with the next motion that's coming, which I believe will pass, and that is to open a commission investigation into the matter. But I, I disagree that the commission doesn't, or that the uh, county commission doesn't have standing or doesn't have an interest in the matter, just simply due to their responsibilities for the the citizenry that they represent and are elected to administer that county. So um, I'm going to support this motion, but not for the not for the reasons stated in the uh, motion to dismiss. Additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Commissioner Pinochi's motion to grant the motion to dismiss, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. All right, Commissioner Pinochi, did you want to move to open a investigative docket? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move a second vote uh, on opening an investigative docket into this matter. Thank you. The motion has been seconded. Discussion? So, Mr. Hamilton, just to clarify the scope of our discussion on this motion. Uh, what we're voting on is to authorize a separate investigation of the adequacy of 911 service uh, over legacy systems in rural Montana, including Weibo County, but not limited to Weibo County, as I understand it. Is that correct, Mr. Hamilton? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. We would be looking at 
any area of rural Montana where the service quality uh, appears to be inadequate. Um, as drafted, the, the scope of the investigation is focused on CenturyLink as the leading carrier uh, of legacy systems across rural Montana. Commissioner Fielder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I sent an email on this. I'm not sure that you received it. I didn't see a response. Maybe I missed it. But my, my question goes to um, whether the other similar companies in Montana should be looked at at the same time. I know I've uh, heard of a number of issues and complaints with this uh, service provider up in Lincoln County, similar similar issues, but did, did you receive that? And did you respond to it? Did I miss it, Mr. Hamilton? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Fielder, yes. Uh, I believe uh, I sent the response Friday uh, of last week, but uh, to summarize, the, the work team on this, which includes regulatory staff, Gary Duncan and Mike Dalton, uh, and I did discuss the, the possibility of expanding the scope of the, of the investigation to include carriers other than um, CenturyLink. I think it's Im important for the commission, if it does decide to expand the scope of the investigation, to clarify that we're only looking at the regulated carriers so that uh, there's no suggestion that the commission is trying to assert authority over co-ops, for example, because I imagine that we would get very strong resistance, which could delay uh, and complicate the, the administration of this investigation. Uh, that said, yeah, uh, regulatory staff uh, in, in consulting uh, with legal staff uh, was of the opinion that the majority of complaints that the commission has received come from CenturyLink. Uh, and, and we were not aware of su substantial issues with other regulated carriers in the state uh, operating these same sorts of, uh, of legacy systems. Uh, that said, uh, if there are other issues with other carriers, uh, I see no reason why the commission would would not uh, also inquire into the adequacy and reasonableness of that infrastructure. Um, we would just want to be careful in how we phrase the scope of the investigation and the notice of commission action that follows today's proceeding to clarify that we're only looking at regulated uh, carriers. And if there are particular regulated carriers that, that need to be examined, uh, like CenturyLink, then we can we can name them in particular. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope that answers uh, your question, Commissioner Fielder. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So... Um, what I'm getting at here is I, I don't want to delay or slow down this process, um, but I'm wondering while we're looking at and while we're while the commission is investigating the, the matter of adequacy of CenturyLink's infrastructure, would it be just as easy to look at the other regulated utility infrastructure, or would that substantially add to the the scope and the the time that this investigation would require? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Fielder, I, I think that it, the inclusion of any additional service territory or additional carriers that may operate on different systems will add to the time required. I, as to whether or not that's a substantial addition to the time required, uh, I don't believe that I could say at this juncture. Perhaps uh, regulatory staff, if Gary's in the room, uh, he might have an opinion on that, having lived through uh, some prior investigations of of this very subject in the past. Um, I, I would also note as part of the staff's recommendation, which doesn't need to be acted on, I believe, in this particular work session, but we would hope to have authorization from the commission to hire an expert uh, with the sort of expertise and, and experience that's required to render an opinion on the adequacy of, of the systems. And to the extent that we have to send that expert to far-flung areas of the state or examine different types of infrastructure, I imagine that that report ends up becoming more costly and complicated. That said, thank you, Gary, for joining me, so I'll pass it over to him. Mr. Duncan. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, commissioners, first of all, if I'd known I was gonna be up here, I'd have put a tie on, but I didn't know I was gonna do it, so. Um, so, so when when you're looking at CenturyLink, CenturyLink is the incumbent local exchange carrier in Montana. Um, and when you look at their infrastructure, you know they do have their legacy infrastructure that was put in back in the '80s. 
Okay. And um, the other regulated carriers in Montana that are incumbent local exchange carriers are Southern, Lincoln, Hot Springs, and Ronan, I think, are the actual regulated ILEX that we're looking at that would might might have this same type of infrastructure. I think the issue, um, Mr. Fielder, as I understand it, that you had mentioned came up with regards to a uh, a certain fiber company that's, that's providing service. Um, in Montana, there are there are what are called competitive local exchange carriers. For example, uh, take a, take Spectrum or a Charter Spectrum. You know they offer internet, phone, cable. Um, what else? Anyway, uh, that's basically what, what they what they provide. Um, and really, the phone business, their local phone business, is a small piece of their business. But under under Montana statute, if a if a provider provides um, two way switched voice service, that's the definition, then they are regulated. What has happened with the Clex in Montana, like Bresnan or Charter, like um, certain other carriers, is we regulate them as far as the service quality of their phone service. We, we have no regulatory authority over Spectrum regarding their internet service or their cable service. But what we do is we do take complaints and handle complaints regarding service quality for Spectrum local service. This applies to other similar carriers. So as I understand it, um, the issue you brought up was with a similar carrier in Northwest Montana. So we're talking there, instead of the legacy infrastructure that you're looking at with CenturyLink, you know, which is basically old cabling going out through carrier systems and out to the customer, what you're talking here is, is, a, is a basically an internet cable company that also provides local service. So it's an entirely different animal than what we're talking about with CenturyLink or the other regulated carrier. Now that does not mean that, that the customers of that entity might not have 911 problems, but it's not gonna be at all the same issue um, network wise that you're looking at with CenturyLink. So it's an entirely different animal. Um, you know, From my perspective, if there is an issue with a carrier such as that with 911 service, then I, then I would suggest that if, if we have enough complaints to we could open a docket specifically for that type of carrier, but it's not the same thing as, you know, the legacy service being provided by, by CenturyLink in rural areas. What has happened with CenturyLink is that, you know, CenturyLink has gone from something like 400,000 subscribers in Montana down to, I think, 60,000 subscribers. So in, in the major urban areas served by CenturyLink, you know, customers have all sorts of choices. They can get voice over internet protocol service from Spectrum. They can get cellular service. Um, they have multiple choices and they've simply, simply, simply left CenturyLink. What has happened with CenturyLink though is there are pockets out there in rural areas served by CenturyLink where customers don't have any choices, such as the case in Weibo. Those customers don't have cell service um they probably have if they have broadband at all it's very limited and it's provided through CenturyLink so you have these pockets served by CenturyLink where these people are sort of stuck with no choices and it's my perception from the last um service quality case that we did that CenturyLink has basically been very reluctant to spend any money serving those types of those pockets of customers the two pockets of customers we identified last time was Weibo, and the other one was Wolf Creek. In both cases, uh, they submitted plans to us to improve service in those areas, and um, and we required reports, and supposedly they, they did fix the service. But I think it's obvious in the case of Weibo, at least, all they did was slap on a Band-Aid. So I, I think that CenturyLink itself stands out in this particular instance as the entity we really ought to be looking at um, versus those other type of carriers. 
Paula. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. And I just, I want to apologize to staff for missing that email because I know you put a lot of work into the communications and, and answering our questions. And I just thinking back to, to Friday last week, I uh, was stunned by a death in the family and I, that's probably why I missed it. But I, I normally do check and apologize for missing your work on this. Thank you for the explanation, Mr. Duncan. Commissioner Panoji. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to fill in a couple blanks for everyone. Uh, while we testify on bills in the last legislative session, actually during the time uh, Commissioner Fielder was swearing in, I had representatives and senators both complain about the issues in their district. Now, I've carefully tried to explain the limitations of what we can do as a commission. And I've told them, if you want to change those limitations, you can introduce legislation. And I've encouraged them to come here and work with the staff and fellow commissioners if they're going to do that. But they have had it. Um, we have complaints of non-working phones for 60 days, 70 days, uh, where in Great Falls, we expect a repair to be done within 24 hours. Um, so uh, CenturyLink needs to understand that uh, the legislative members see the ETC money come in and get spent in counties that have no complaints at all, and I can't direct ETC money into the very counties that need problems. And they look at government as a failure when they see that. Uh, how could we be spending millions of dollars in counties that have no complaints at all? And we can't get the money to where people's lives are in danger where 911 is not working correctly. They're absolutely correct to bring that concern up. I'm going to try to corral them here to work with us. And um, if they're going to introduce legislation, hopefully we can help guide them and uh, to work with them. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I wanted to point out that, uh, expand upon my comments that not only is this problem unique to Weibo County, it is not unique to any county in Montana. It is not unique to Montana itself. Uh, the uh, I've been in discussions with uh, uh, people at uh, NARIC, uh, at uh, different commissions, at uh, related organizations, uh, the Montana Telecommunications Association. I just got a list of the members of the Montana 911 Commission or Committee. I forget what their exact title is. Uh, but this is uh, a problem that uh, is being experienced uh, over the entire country. When you have any type of a legacy system like this that, as Mr. Duncan has pointed out, is uh, can be nearly 40 years old here. Uh, the technology is changing on there. Uh, so there is no uh, really simple, easy transition from one technology uh, usage to another. So we're in the middle of that right now. I notice from some of the really great investigative work by uh, uh, Commission Staff uh, uh, Mike Dalton, on this, that uh, a number of years ago, the uh, uh, on the federal level, the Telecommunications Act was uh, was amended to uh, redirect. Uh, it seems to me a lot of the attention to legacy systems to to uh, broadband systems, and uh, at that time. Uh, uh, there were uh, a lot more than the 60,000 here. Uh, that legacy system, I think, was able to financially support itself. Uh, and and uh, in terms of Band-Aids, uh, is that my understanding of this is that uh, uh, components of this system cannot really be, be uh, fixed except with Band-Aids because nobody is manufacturing equipment uh, uh, replacement equipment right now. So they have to use old equipment to keep on shifting it uh, back and forth. Uh, it's a nationwide problem, uh, one that uh, 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 other jurisdictions are looking into. And I myself have uh, initiated some uh, uh, some links to get some information on this, which would be useful to uh, uh, inform uh, a study by this by this commission. I would also note 
that the actual language recommended by staff um, uh, staff recommends that the commission authorize a separate inve- investigation of the adequacy adequacy of 911 service over legacy systems in rural Montana. It, it is not specific to CenturyLink. Uh, it's looking at that whole 911 system, as Commissioner uh, Pinocchi pointed out, uh, lives depend upon the reliability and the adequacy of, of this system. So, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Duncan. Yeah, I, I'd add a couple of comments to that. First of all, I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but I, I noticed um, that earlier this year, I think CenturyLink um, sold its rural, its its uh, its ILEC systems, its uh, local exchange system, I think in like 20 states for like seven, I think it was seven and a half billion dollars. They're obviously trying to get out of that legacy phone business. Um, the other comment I would have is, you know, this really isn't an issue per se with the 911 system. It's an issue with the customer having access to the 911 service because of their the poor quality of their local phone service. And for example, the equipment that that we're talking about out of Weibo, um, I'm really dating myself here, but back in 1982. Um, what was then Mountain Bell agreed with the commission to get rid of party line service. I don't know. Some of you may remember party line, party line service and some of you don't, but anyway, that was actually a massive undertaking and they went into all the rural areas and upgraded the systems to give people single party calling. And the, so a lot of the stuff that's sitting out there in Weibo was put in in 1982. There's stuff out there out of Weibo that was put in way before 1982. I know there's still what are called open wire circuits where you actually have telephone poles and they actually string open copper wires between poles. I know there are runs out there that are going across, they're not along county roads, they go across across the countryside that are open wire. That's, that's an issue. They have the, the carrier systems out there are what are called anaconda carrier systems. They were manufactured discontinued back in, I think, the late 70s, even though they put some in in 1982. So you can't get parts for them. Um, there's, a, there's issues out there. All those carrier systems, some of them are still on commercial power. So if the power goes out, the carrier system goes out and customers lose their deal. Um, the carrier systems are so those carrier systems are subject to extreme cold outages. I had a long conversation with the manager that uh, used to be the operation manager out there in Glendale. And when I mentioned Weibo to him, I got an hour's worth. Okay. But he said, for example, when they discovered that the systems would go out with um, extreme cold, what he and his what he had his crew do was in some of these boxes they went out and they actually strung from the commercial power they put light bulbs in the boxes to keep them on in the winter. Now I don't know if those light bulbs are burnt out now or what's going on, but I mean I mean that is the state of that equipment out there, and that's not you're not just looking at that. I think in Weibo, I think there are other areas that are like that. His comment to me, and this is only his opinion, was he said that system is non-repairable. Um, just like you said, you can't put band-aids on it anymore. So anyway, yeah, these legacy systems, it's not an issue just in Weibo. There's other areas in Montana and it's a national problem with these large legacy carriers. So. Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Duncan, I may well be, uh, uh, as President Bush used to say, misremembering here, so please tell me if I am. Um, but didn't CenturyLink acquire these legacy systems from another carrier, and hasn't that been relatively recently? Um Vice Chairman Johnson, the, the systems were, no, these, these systems that we're talking about were Mountain Bell. They were Mountain Bell, of course, which became U.S. West, which became Quest, which became CenturyLink. Um, but these systems, you know, Mountain Bell was put together from Rocky Mountain Bell way back when, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Now, 
U.S. West did have another 70 properties in Montana, rural properties, which were sold to the independence companies in, in the early 90s. And of course, those independent companies have gone in and, you know, you don't see these problems with the co-ops typically or the other regulated small companies. They, they've modernized all this equipment. Uh, but no, this is a this is the legacy problem from follow up, Mr. Chairman. What, uh, Mr. Duncan, what I was getting at is, is uh, I, I had a recollection that that there'd been some some sort of transaction recently enough that that's um, uh, CenturyLink ought to be fully aware of its absolute obligation as a regulated utility with a legacy copper line system to provide uh, this adequate level of service to its customers. That's what I was getting at, that that, that there shouldn't be any question uh, about their responsibility and their awareness of that responsibility to maintain this adequate level of service. Is that a, um, an accurate assessment? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Johnson, I'd say yes, that's true. The, these exact same questions came up five years ago about adequacy of service and particularly access to emergency service. You know, if, if, you, if your phone's not working so you can dial 911, that is a health and safety issue. And, you know, the, the, the utilities have, they have an obligation to provide safe and reliable service. I mean, that's an absolute given. And that, that was what, that's, that's the issue that we sort of based this on five years ago. I would say the, the issue, I think another recommendation in, um, in that memorandum is that we do, if we do go forward with this investigation, we need to hire some sort of engineering firm or engineering company or engineering consultant to help us look at this. I think the problem that we had last time was we had nobody on staff like that. I'm not an engineer. So we identified the problems in Weibo and Wolf Creek and but we were at the mercy at that time of CenturyLink to have them come in and say, here's the network problems and here's how we'll address them and here how we'll fix them. But we had no expertise in that area. So we were basically sort of at their mercy. And I think it's becoming quite apparent now that, um, you know, that the solutions they suggested and, and supposedly did, and I think they did do what they said they were going to do, were not adequate. So I think it's absolutely imperative if we, if we do this that we get some sort of outside help to help us look at these this, this network out there. So. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Additional discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Commissioner Panocci's motion uh, to authorize a commission Investigation of the adequacy of 911 service over legacy systems in rural Montana, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. Seeing no opposition, motion carries unanimously. Mr. Aye. Chairman. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, question of clarification. Uh, is it implicit in that motion that we um, uh, back to, uh, adopt Mr. Duncan's recommendation that we uh, evaluate the, the possibility of an outside uh, professional consultant, is that? Yes, it is impl thank implicit you, in Chairman. that motion. All right, thank you, Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Duncan. All right, I would just uh, remind commissioners that we do have a one o'clock informational meeting here in the Bulgin room. Um, and with that, no further business coming before us. I adjourn today's meeting. Time is now 10.35 a.m.